Welcome to the Behavior Speak podcast. Now, here's your host, Ben Ryman. Welcome to another episode of the Behavior Speak podcast. I'm your host, Ben, and I'm excited today to have Dr. Allison Cox with me. Allison is a professor at uh, Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. Yeah, she's done. Uh, she does a, a lot of cool things, um, and right now she's been doing a lot of kind of research around uh, the use of psychotropic medications, and uh, you know how those affect uh, behavior and and everything in between. Um, so, welcome to the show, Allison. Thank you for having me. This is uh, very exciting. This is my first podcast, so I hope uh, I come up with some interesting stuff that generates. Uh, you know, some interest in the topic and uh, maybe some ideas for budding behavior analysts in terms of research for a master's thesis or PhD, or even, you know, if you're a clinician and you want to start to kind of get into research a bit more and you've been doing clinical work for a long time, you could hook up with someone like me or somebody else uh, to get some research going in your, wherever you're working. Cool. I'm already excited. I might be I'm I might be one of your first to call then. Um, well, I hope I hope you do, Ben. <laughs> as a master's student myself, who uh, wouldn't mind, you know, expanding into that realm one day. Perfect. Um, yeah, that's wicked. I like to kind of start uh, the way uh, a lot of the folks in uh, behavior analysis podcast land do, and um, get a little bit kind of on your origin story. So a bit on how you got into the field and kind of how you ended up uh, eventually. Uh, at Brock, and and then finally, kind of how your interest in research around uh, medications came to be. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's a fun thing to start with, and it's really easy. It's like low response effort. You're not starting with the hard hitting questions <laughs> right away. So Behavioral like, oh, momentum. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. So I actually uh, started volunteering at a early um, intensive behavioral intervention, like many of us, but I was just child minding so that parents of the children who were in the program could attend parent nights and, and information nights. And the volunteer coordinator was also the clinical coordinator. Um, and so when a job came up, he said, you know, you work really well with the kids. Why don't you come out and give it a try? I did. And I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I didn't, uh, I was like, okay, I need to learn more about this. So I spent a year doing that. And actually I went to Brock and I was for my master's, I was the first, the second MA year. So the program had just started like three years before. And uh, this was the second year where they had the MA, which was different than the professional program. So they have two programs there, which Mm. they still do. One is for clinicians who want to get their master's in applied uh, disability studies. It's called the MADS. Mm. And they... um, are part-time students or full-time students, but they're usually working part-time or full-time and they don't have a thesis component. Yeah. So there was that program. And then, so I was the master's stream, which was the thesis component stream. And uh, I did some really neat work actually in uh, recently deinstitutionalized individuals because way back then, I'm going to date myself, but in 2008, deinstitutionalization was like just coming to a close. So like there were still, I think there was still like one or two facilities that were moving individuals into the residences and homes and out of these institutions. So institutions aren't a thing we do anymore in Ontario. And so we were looking at uh, things around optimizing care in the community. And my research question actually was about, you know, access and utilization of primary care, psychiatric care. And so that's sort of where I was like, oh, this is, this is a thing. And then, I, you know, when I'm collecting this data, I'm going, a lot of these people are taking a lot of drugs <laughs> or medi- medications. And because I had only worked with IBI kiddos, mm. um, you really don't see a lot of medication in the really young kiddos. And, and at that point in Ontario, we were really, they were like three to six years old. Like we, we still had the age cut off and all that stuff. So I was like, oh, interesting. So I finished that. Uh, I worked for two years uh, as a BCBA. Uh, I got my BCBA about seven months into working and I worked with this killer psychiatrist. She was a force to be reckoned with. And she consulted for the agency I worked for on the condition that she had behavior analysts working. Wow. Yes. 
That, right? that, that's not a common condition for a psychiatrist. Not at all. She's like, I need data. I need to know this and this and this. And if you showed, oh, God help you, if you showed up to those appointments on behalf of your clients, like with your clients and did not have your data in order. She's, she made me cry once because I couldn't find something I was looking for. And I had all this <laughs> paper and she was like, Allison, like get it together. And I was like, oh, it was Anyway, so she was great. But what was really neat is sort of how she made the decisions around prescriptions and changes and things mm. like that. And so I said, there's got to be something behavior analytic, like research wise. And really, at that point, I mean, there was stuff, but there really wasn't a lot. I was like, could this be a, you know, a dissertation topic? So you know, it, it turns out, in fact, that it was and could be. And so I found myself at the University of Manitoba. Life circumstance wanted me to stay in Canada, and also I wanted to stay in Canada. So, um, and it just so happened that uh, Javier Beruas Ortega was there at the time, and mm. so that worked out really well. Nice. I was very, yes, I was very happy to um, have been able to work with him. So he kind of let me do what I wanted. He wasn't really into that sort of topic. Um, the advisor who I was supposed to be co-advised by did leave the university before I arrived, and so she was really the one who had sort of her her really had a good understanding and had published on this topic. And mm. so Javier was like, well, I, I know you came under the intention that you wanted to do this research. So go ahead and do it and I'll work with you. I was like, oh, cool. So he's, you know, really bright and was helpful um, in that aspect. Uh, so I did my, I make it sound like, oh, I did my dissertation. But let me tell you, recruiting for this research is not easy, not mm -hmm. easy. So that was like a bit of a, oh my God, am I going to get this done? But I did. Um, and I came back actually to work as a clinical coordinator in an EIBI program for the same program that I started out in many years before. Amazing. <laughs> yes. So I got my PhD um, while I was working, like I just finished everything off. And then I worked in as a private practitioner for two years or so, some really interesting, severe problem behavior, I had some great mentorship during that private work. But when a position at Brock came up, I was like, oh, this is this is where I need to be. So I still do private work on the side, but I think I'm I'm trying to be as impactful as I can. And I think teaching students is a really great way to, um, you know, really get some good clinicians out there doing some really interesting work and generating interest in, you know, adult clients. Because I, mm. when I was working with psychiatry, obviously that first psychiatrist who scares me, but is brilliant. Uh, <laughs> she, it was, she, we were working with adults. And so I really like to generate interest in my students in working with adults, working with traumatic uh, individuals with traumatic brain injury, because that's an also a population that really there's a lot of medications that are utilized above and beyond, you know, so if, if there's aggression issues or other things like that, then oftentimes the default is medication when mm -hmm. in fact they don't really have necessarily a really strong foundation or they don't have a, a strong presence of behavior analysis in the units that are supporting these, you know, hard to serve clients who are aggressive, but are, you know, their the aggression is secondary to the TBI. So uh, there, I, I like to try to generate interest in sort of this wider array of um, clientele as opposed to just like the cute babies, which they're really cute. And I love that work, obviously, because yeah. I spent many years, a couple of years doing it myself. But I really like to try to branch out into these other populations that are sort of like almost forgotten. And that's actually the the paper that you had said, the, the more recent one around looking at you know trends in adult research. And if anybody is interested, that one is, uh, it's uh, my name, Coxadal 2021. And that one is looking at sort of the, I, I, it's basically a call to action because we really don't have enough research in adult populations. And a lot of times what we're forcing our clinicians to do is to sort of pull on research that was informed by you know, child or adolescent participants mm -hmm. and apply them to the adult population because there just isn't enough research that features adults. And so I think that we are sort of doing ourselves a little bit of a disservice because we can't seem to um, recruit or produce the literature that features adult participants as much as we do. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. <laughs> well, actually, actually, you are, but you know, and, and, and I know we said before we kind of pressed record that we might not go there, but I kind of want to go there now. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a tiny bit. I, I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit about, more about this study because the only reason I say is I've always had an interest in adults. I've never had an interest in children. Uh, and so for me, EIBI was never something I was interested in whatsoever. I was mm -hmm. sort of forced into it, we'll say, because 
at the time, my uh, master's supervisor told me, you're really not going to get into this program without some experience working in early intervention, yeah. which was, you know, I understood why, because the program was kind of designed for that and the competition was so strong and, and, and all the folks that were kind of coming into it were coming from that realm. But, uh, you know, I was, my, my master's thesis was, was an adult study and I had only worked with adults. And so, so I had an opportunity to present a bit of it and, and, and do a, a panel at, ABBA in 2011 with Peter Gerhardt and, oh, great. Yeah. and, uh, and a couple other folks. And really the, the, the main message from him during that panel was nobody's doing adult research. And, <laughs> and, and he, he will love this paper then I should, I should see if I can, you know, randomly cold email and be like, Hey, read this paper. <laughs> yeah, no. So I'm, so I'm actually kind of curious kind of what you did find in the paper. And, uh, yes. yeah. Yeah. So we did, um, it was actually a brief review so okay. we only looked at four journals in the last and over the last 20 years. Uh, you know, spoiler, this is going to be a research project for my incoming one of my incoming MA students, because I basically want to look at, um, you know, is this brief review? Does it sort of correlate with a full some systematic review? Oh, very good. Yeah. And yeah. And so if it does, then, you know, there's that that, that has many implications anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the current report um, we looked at last 20 years uh, was um, JABA. Oh, my God. I can't even remember all the journals now. It's all right. Okay. Uh, oh, there it is. It's in my paper. Okay. Oh. BA in practice, uh, behavioral interventions and BMOD or yeah, and BMOD. Right. So we did those four and we have various reasons why. And what we found was child participants were featured more often. So 78% compared to adult participants at 22%. Mm. Um, and we also looked at other research or, or methodological or trends. Uh, and so um, things like severity. So how often are we seeing the term severe being used as so how much research on severe problem behavior are we actually seeing? And uh, so we go on to kind of talk about clinical implications and all of that jazz. But essentially, there's some there are nice little um, graphs in here, line graphs that show um, this decreasing trend. So we split mm -hmm. it into two decades, basically, what was it, 1998 to 2008, and then 2008 to 2018. And uh, it was this declining trend. It's very clear that there's actually less, re much less research going on in adults now than there was, you know, in from 98 to 2008. So um, not only... Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So not only is is overall are we seeing less research, just that was the whole when I give you the 78 and 22, that's just like in general. But we are seeing this decreasing trend. And then we also talk about the trends and stuff, uh, depending. So there's more variability in some of the research. So uh, in some of the papers, so you might have like, uh, you know, 100 percent of the articles in one issue are um, featuring adults. And then you the very next issue, there are none. Right. Mm -hmm. And so but some of them, there's more. Um, so Java seems to be a little bit more consistent in terms of very seldomly having uh, featured issues where problem behavior is something that the folks are looking at. And there were mm -hmm. no adults, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, we might see a little bit more zero rates in um, BMOD, for example. So we talk about stuff like that, too. OK, cool. Yeah. You know, and so that makes me think about, you know, when I was kind of doing my lit review for my study and. And I found that most of the adult research was, you know, actually the, the, the 20 years before that. So, you know, mm. the, the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. there, was, there, there was, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of research in those journals, a lot more research in those journals in the 70s that kind of involved adults because I think folks had a lot of access to hospitals, psychiatric yes. hospitals and institutions, um, yes. right? And institutions were the big place for study, of course, as, and, and, you know, and, and I think some of that. Is, is familiar for Ontario. I think what the CAMH is sort of a an offshoot, isn't it, of an institution at one point or something. And so, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm not surprised to kind of see that. But what's also I think is interesting is, and, and maybe maybe this will come out with some of your students, those particular journals aren't really known for adult research. There is more adult research, but they're not in those journals. Mm. You know, that, so that would be interesting to see if that's um, what comes out with a comprehensive review. I mean, I think you're still probably going to find the same thing. I think you're still going to find a focus, so. a focus, a focus on children for sure. Yeah, absolutely. But even if you did like a comprehensive review, I, you know, I think it'll be similar. But I, it, so for me, I, I was able to find more in in kind of more of the, I guess the 
PBS specific type journals. So ah. like the Journal of Positive Behavior Interventions had a lot. There's that newer uh, International Journal of Positive Behavior Support out of the UK that ha- seems to have a lot. There's a lot of research in general in the UK on adults um, mm-hmm. that you might. You is, might it, is it in problem behavior? Or is yeah. it just like in general? Okay. Oh, yeah. I know. 100%. And it's all kind of, a lot of it is kind of group home, residential care kind of focused. Because yep. mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of that going on there. And that makes some sense based on, you know, the, another one of the, the study you were talking about that uh, they did with the folks in Wales. So, yep. I mean, there, there's a lot of programs over there that are that are starting to see a little more. So that's interesting. But yeah, it's 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 brutal that the, the research keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and and considering how much, you know, how much is lacking for supports for, you know, for adults. And then yeah. if we don't have any evidence to back supports for adults, how are we ever going to have supports for adults? Yeah, 100 percent, 100 percent. And how do you continue to justify paying for a BA or BCBA who supports, you know, group homes? Well, mm-hmm. you know, part of it is, you know, this is evidence based, this and that. But if the evidence isn't there, it's like, well, how are we support? And there actually the paper goes into like some possible reasons why we're not seeing adult participants as often featured. And then it also talks about uh, how we might be able to do that. So it generates some ideas. So it's not just this paper that's like, oh, here's all the problems and good night. You know, like it. we actually, you know, we were we were challenged by the reviewers. And I love the reviewers because they were they really worked with us on this. And I was so pleased that they did. It took quite some time back and forth, back and forth. But um, I was really pleased that they wanted to work with us on this. And part of that was like, they were like, well, this is great. But where are the solutions? And I was like, oh, <laughs> well, I guess we should include those too. So we had to add a bunch of potential solutions and ways that you can kind of get around to, to start to beef up this number. And it's, so I like that about it because it's not just here's the problem. Problem. It's a here's some solutions as well that you could try. Which uh, I'm curious, which I, I have to go back and look at it. Which which journal did you publish this one in? Uh, that was Behavior Development. Oh, so interesting. Not not one of the four. No, <laughs> no, it was not published in one of the four. Yeah, <laughs> behavioral, <laughs> behavioral development. Yeah. So this is kind of a nice segue, I suppose, because by not having you know the good research for adults and therefore not having the good evidence-based interventions uh, for adults. Instead, we just have adults on medication. Yes, we do. Oh, that was a beautiful segue. It's almost like you planned that. Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Not Uh, at all. No. And so that's kind of, uh, you know, what been the focus of a lot of your research. And so uh, so what kind of work have you been doing around medication? Yeah, so I the most recent uh, pub I have out is um, the one that's in perspectives on behavior, uh, behavior science. And uh, specifically, it was just this great group in Wales had a bunch of data. We connected at ABAI when we used to be able to connect at ABAI in mm-hmm. person. And, uh, you know, we, we got together and they were like, well, we want, you know, we wa- we have some anecdotal thoughts about what we're seeing, the trends we're seeing, like, how can we make this real? How can we look at this from an objective lens? How can we come up with numbers so we can speak to, you know, the people that they need to speak to in the multidisciplinary team to get, you know, to advocate for the, um, in the best interest of the client, et cetera, et cetera. So it actually was really great timing because this was a special call paper for, or a special issue Mm. uh, for perspectives on behavior science, because this is not normally the stuff that they um, publish. And so it was kind of perfect timing that we got it out. Um, when we did. And basically, we were looking at data that was collected by, you know, frontline staff overseen by a master's level behavior analyst. And the principal at the school is a BCBAD or was a BCBAD. He's, um, he's retired now. So yay him. So Mm -hmm. uh, we were, we wanted to try to speak to because I think I feel like I'm reiterating this, but this is I'm not reiterating it because you hadn't pressed record yet. So I'm, I'm, saying, it, I'm saying it for the first time to folks. That's right. But we wanted to, I think sometimes the d- divide between psychiatrists and behavior analysts could be that a lot of psychiatrists, or I may be speaking out of turn, but the psychiatrists that I've experienced and worked mm-hmm. with, even the really great um, gal who I spoke about earlier, they don't have as much exposure to single case design. Other than that, like they call it a case study and then they don't think that it has any validity or whatever. Right. Sure. So if we start to sort of speak to them about things that they understand, 
like effect size, because that's something you commonly see in uh, group design. Okay. Uh, you know, confidence intervals are something that we really don't talk about in behavior anal analysis mm. as much as, you know, the other visual analysis stuff that we tend to do. Uh, things like non-parametric inferential statistics. Statistics may, and this kind of pulls on that earlier discussion you had with, um, with Mark, I'll put a plug in episode eight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so listen to that one if you haven't uh, yet. But uh, there is a place for um, you know statistics in the work that we do. And so we basically put together this um, analysis that one could bring with lots of data because these clients who were living in this residence had been there for many years. And there was a, they sort of supported severe problem behavior, adolescents with severe problem behavior whose placement had broken down or like just some really tough to serve clients. And so they had years worth of data, some of them. And so it's like, how do you pull out these subtle trends and how do you maybe use them to inform you know, next steps in a multidisciplinary treatment team. So that might include, hey, this kid seems to really respond to medication mm. based on this correlation that we observe. Or So it's all association, right? We know it's not correlation doesn't equal causation, but it gives you an inkling as to, okay, where, where are we going to have the big bang items? And so we did a non-partial, uh, non-parametric partial correlation as well to try to control for, because these interventions, medication and behavior analysis were ongoing at the same time, right? Concurrent application. So how do you pull out one, you control for one right. so that you can see the relationship, whether it still exists or not, when you control for that other one, right? And so that's what basically what a partial correlation is. And so we were able to kind of look at that and, and suggest what could be going on in this paper. So that's the, the gist of it. And there were several medication changes across the four participants that were featured. And uh, I'm hoping that people will read it and go, okay, this is something I could like really take hold of to advocate on the best on behalf of my client. I actually have a follow-up study that I want to do that is creating like a, um, an online training for mm. behavior analysts who are interested in like this series of analysis. And I want to see if like an online training can produce, you know, mastery, quote unquote. And then I would hope to follow it up and say, like, have you applied any of this stuff like a year from now or whatever? But I'm, I'm hoping that people are interested. Here's a plug for that. If people are interested in kind of, you know, dusting off their stats, uh, you know, chops. And it's not even really stats. Like I said, it's like it's like brushing the surface and it, I'm trying to generate or I, try, I kind of already created the materials before. Um, I'm trying to create it, it easy, something that's easy that you can really, um, you know, grasp and have access to regardless of where you are in the world, especially in the context of COVID. So <laughs> it's a COVID proof mm -hmm. study, I guess. Totally. <laughs> if you're planning on collecting continuing education credits for this episode, you'll need to write down the three secret words. Once you've written down the three secret words, you can submit them with your purchase of CEUs at cbiconsultants.com. The first secret word is Brock, B-R-O-C-K, Brock. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see, I mean, for sure, I, I, I would take it. Uh, I definitely see, we, we don't have a lot of training on that kind of stuff at all. And I don't remember anything from the stats courses that I took. I did well in them, but I don't remember them at all because I never mm -hmm. use any of that stuff at all. Um, and the research that, you know, my supervisor was doing was not, uh, I mean, there was, I think there was a bit around effect size, but um, there wasn't much else going on for, in terms of stats. Yeah. Although, although we did do some, I think he did do some studies with where he collaborated with the, the statistics guy at UBC yeah. and, and they came up with things that never really made any sense to me, but I, I love the idea that you chose some of these, I mean, so you chose some of these measures, I think, cause you kind of had to, so to try to measure, you know, what's happening with meds and, and interventions at the same time that's hard to do mm -hmm. and normally mm -hmm. you need to sort of they often suggest okay well don't do any more med changes till we finish our program or yeah. don't do any more program changes till we finish our meds or whatever and and uh and that you know would certainly be hard from a research perspective i can tell you i can tell you that no research ethics board in the world would say yeah you can go ahead and 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 tell the psychiatrist to hold off on two more med changes so you could collect some more data. Like yeah. that's that's just not going to happen. So unfortunately, unless you have an in with like some clinical trial that wherein the FA is sort of like 
embedded in how we're going to run this research. Mm. Uh, it's and, and there was early work in that. I think uh, Jennifer Zarconi in 2004, um, mm. I think she was part of some initiative like that. So she had some really tight controls on that research, which was awesome to see. But it's just so difficult to replicate. Like I basically walk into a group home and I'm like, hey, you want to do some research? And they're like, well, that's not how it goes, right? Obviously, mm-hmm. there's, there's, you know, ethics boards and this and that. Um, but they're not going to say, oh, yeah, we'll take this person off all their meds so you can get a clean baseline. Yeah. And then we'll react like nobody is going to do that. So you're like, oh, okay, so your baseline is six medications. Cool. And we know that your doctor is considering changing the meds because this isn't working for you. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, whatever you change next, that's going to be our next condition. Like, unfortunately, that is the name of the game for the most part. So we got to roll with it. And that's what this this paper talks about is like there there is a place for this type of research. It's not tight. It's not controlled as controlled as behavior analysts like to think about how their single case designs could be or should be. But there is a place for it, at least in generating hypotheses so that people who may have access to those sort of tight controls around medications could run with it and say, okay, this is a viable hypothesis because we've got all of this sort of retrospective or data that wasn't as controlled and it's all pointing to this. So I'm going to empirically investigate that uh, prospectively. Uh, So that's sort of the idea of this paper as well. And I talk about that in the paper too. So I hear you. (laughs) <laughs> no, there's a couple exciting, fun things there. So one piece that also I, I like that you, that and if I, if I heard you correctly, you actually selected a lot of these statistical analyses solely because those are the ones that psychiatrists use. Um, not necessarily. No. Um, okay. I'm not no, gonna that. Yeah, right. no, that's okay. I thought that they were a good fit because I've used effect size before in terms of looking at whether or not there was this. So that was my 2016 paper with Javier is Cox and Brew is Ortega. And that mm-hmm. was looking at sort of this over like overall in the FA literature that uh, assesses medication changes. Basically, that's the long short of it. Like how much of an effect do these medications have on rate? And so we had decided in that paper that effect size made the most sense. And so I'm thinking about that paper. And I was like, that absolutely applies to what we're trying to do here. So we want to see this sort of very macro. Is there this macro change? And that can be Mm. measured by effect size. And then the confidence intervals are always nice because it gives you a sense, like you get confidence intervals that come out with these effect sizes and it gives you a sense of how genuine or certain the result is. So if you got this huge effect size or this huge confidence interval, eh, the believability could be you know, suspect. Sure. Mind you that those size of the confidence intervals are also dependent on the number of data points you have in that condition. So you have to, like, it's taken with a grain of salt. And then the conditional rates, actually, we pulled that idea um, from a paper that RAP did in 2009. Hmm. I can't remember offhand. Hang on. I'll find hmm. it. Anyway, so, um, oh, 2007. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, RAP, 2007. And they did that because they were trying to see, um, they were try- using it in the context of evaluating medications in their treatment unit. The non parametric inferential stats stuff like the the non-parametric correlation i mean that was just straightforward like is there a relationship Mm -hmm. between these variables and then the non-parametric i was interested because i wanted to control for that third because these behavior programs and the medications were happening at the same time which is often the case even if you control for a phase where you're like okay we're not going to make any bsp changes you still have a bsp going on you're applying a BSP while the medication is happening. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're saying, okay, we're going to stop all the BSP protocols and we're just going to run. That would be something, I think Fisher did that in like the 90s. He was able to actually stop. I think he compared token economy and response cost to uh, haloperidol, which is a really heavy duty um, uh, medication that they used to put all a lot of these folks on. That's nasty, nasty side effects. But uh, that would be truly like in the... uh, it's one of the only ones I can remember offhand that w- had a really tight control like that. Uh, some of the stimulant meds research will do that. So there's some great work in 97 by Northopadal and 99. And they were actually looking at preference shifts, which is mm. never looked at. It was really cool in the context of um, methylphenidate. And the mm. great thing about, yeah, methylphenidate, it's a stimulant, right? Mm. We, we know it as Ritalin or something like that. And yeah, yeah. The, the cool thing about that is that it has a short half-life. And that means that once, like, once you don't take it, it's like out of your system in four hours. So if anyone works with kids who have like three dosages a day and they have a nine, 12 and three or something like that, when the dosages are given that 1130 point, 
your kid's starting to get a little hairy, right? If the mm-hmm, med is like, mm-hmm. if, the, if, if the med is addressing that ADHD piece, which is usually what it's being prescribed yep. for, then uh, then your your kid might get a little squirrely because like right before 12, because it has such a short half life. So that's a really great opportunity to be like, okay, we know that it's not in their system at this point, and so if you're if you right. have it, right. But the problem with some most a lot of these meds that the folks are on, A is they're on so many of them, but B, the half-lives are like for respirito, for example, is between three and twenty-one hours. Okay. So that means that if they miss a dosage, they're still the dosage up to twenty-one hours later, the dosage could still be in their system, but half. So if I have a five milligram, you know, dosage and I take it, and then maybe I only have one a day. I don't know who would do that, but whatever. Maybe I only have one a day. And I miss it the next day. The following day, that's two cycles. So five divided by two divided by two. Again, I've still got 1.75 in my system Mm. by the third day. So like in terms of like, okay, can we evaluate um, when it's going on? Like when it's out of the body, when it's or when it's out of the system, when it's not in the out of the system, you know, that becomes much trickier and people like aren't really thinking about that. Um, No. So there's all these variables that make it really tough to evaluate, which is why I said like, it's, it's, it's hard to recruit people. It's hard to like really control for a lot of this stuff. And then, you know, in, in my dissertation, which is hopefully accepted, uh, it, it was accepted, I think pending revision or something. I don't know. I've been working at it so long because I graduated in 2015, but it's been like this ongoing thorn in my side. Um, I will get it published. But one of the folks went away for three weeks because he went back home to visit his parents and as well he should. But sure. I couldn't collect any data, right? So like, uh, right, it's 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 tricky with uh, with that stuff. Anyway, I digress yet again. No, all good. Uh, and it also, th- there's a facility that I used to work in out here in BC where, and, and I imagine they have them other places where, you know, this kind of work could be really good, cool. They, they they recently actually brought in a BCBAs, but it's it's a essentially it's a, a assessment center for you know folks with you know really super severe challenging behavior that are also mm-hmm. on a lot of a lot of medication, um, uh, often you know just over prescribed and yeah. you know and, and and a mess essentially. And what they do in the in this center is they take them off all their medication. Oh, I love it. And there's a lot of. There's constant sort of medical assessment. So there's yes. psych psych nurses on staff. They have psych, psychiatrists on staff. They have, like I said, they now have a BCBA, and then slowly kind of reintroduce medications to figure um, out what the know. what the mix should be. Exactly. I'm, I, I'm not standing here being anti med. I'm, yeah. I'm anti keeping status quo because just because, right? Like yeah. if we had an intervention as behavior analysts that it was clear it wasn't working. Would we just continue to add junk on top of it? No, right. that's, we would remove the ineffective intervention um, components and try something different. And so I'm about, you know, finding the right mix. And this was the the psychiatrist that I told you about earlier that I worked mm-hmm. with, the very first one. She said, I'm here to work myself out of a job. Basically, I want you on the lowest possible dose that's therapeutically appropriate and it's doing what it's supposed to do. And if that's no meds, great. If it's a teeny bit of meds, great. Like if it's a little bit more, fine. But basically she's constantly trying to work it down um, mm-hmm. so that it's just at that perfect level, which is, I I was very encouraged by that. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's cool. And so I just, I thought maybe a place like that would be a cool place to do research because. Oh, that would be an amazing place to do research. If they had the interest, I would be really happy to, uh, to help out on that, on that front. Even if I took like a consulting role around, okay, how, what, how can we get the most out of our data sets? How can we yeah. generate some prospective studies? Because we really want to do, you know, and everybody really wants to do good work. Like I, I can't imagine, you know, I've not, I've had some uh, clinical work with psychiatrists. And I can tell you that nobody's going in being like, I'm going to really make this person's life miserable. No, mm-hmm. they're not doing that. They want it. They're working at the, uh, you know, the best they can to try to support these guys and, and, and give them the best quality of the life. So it's more about, you know, finding that balance and, and using some of the skills that we're not as familiar with specifically with that paper, like some of those analyses techniques or protocols, whatever, to really get the most out of the data that we have. Right on. Well, I think we've been kind of 
going on a lot about uh, medications in general, but just maybe for some for some folks who just have no idea, there really isn't a lot of stuff out there for, I think, continuing education in general on medications for behavior analysts. I know there's, uh, we talked in our pre chat you know, Tom Freeman's got a course he's been running forever at, at FIT and, um, and uh, but I haven't seen a whole lot of other stuff. First off, what is, uh, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, what's behavioral pharmacology? Is that different than what we're talking about? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say that there is a bit of a distinction because I, I see that more as falling in the basic realm. Mm. Un- unless it specifically says applied behavioral pharmacology. So there's the, gotcha. um, Van Weeden um, and his uh, colleague did a paper on some, it's called some guidelines for conducting research in applied behavioral pharmacology. So that was around, okay, where can you loosen up protocols because we know in the applied world, it's not going to be as tight as you can run it with a with a mice or with mice or with a rat or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So um, they identified like what are some of the things you can really have and what can you kind of play with. So I would say that 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 distinction to me when someone says behavioral pharmacology, I think okay, that's probably more basic. But if they kind of contextualize that by saying applied, then I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, so that's a little bit more in line with the kind of work that I'm trying. Gotcha, gotcha, do. okay. Uh, and so kind of going back to basics, what even are psychotropic medications? Yeah. So, um, I just standard definition, uh, chemical substances that cross the blood brain barrier, altering mood, thought, and behavior. Okay. So that's, that's it, right? They, uh, we know them as antipsychotics, mm-hmm. uh, anti-epileptics, right. antidepressants, anxiolytics mood stabilizers, stimulants. So that's a generally a set of, like categorized into sort of six categories of them. And uh, so yeah, go ahead. And so what what do they do? Like what are their effects on on a person and kind of how do side effects play into it? Like what, what I guess first off, I guess the the first question would be what are, what are the common ones we see as as behavior analysts and then what kind of effects do they have and side effects and that sort of thing? Yeah, so it's Commonly, I mean, it just depends on who you're sort of working with. Um, Risperidone and aripiprazole are probably ones that ring a bell for most folks. They are atypical antipsychotics, and they are the only FDA-approved medications for the treatment of aggression and irritability in persons with autism. Hmm. So I emphasize autism because that is sort of where they have been identified as approved to manage aggression or irritability. But as you know, behavior analyst irritability can look like anything, mm-hmm. right? So it's kind of loose. Um, other ones that I've seen and people might be familiar with, things like olanzapine, um, maybe Seroquel or Quetiapine. Yep. Um, methylphenidate, better known as like Ritalin, yep. is one that I see uh, quite often. And then it, it really varies in terms of the products that the psychiatrist or the prescribing physician uses. So some other folks might use, uh, uh, I don't know, chlorpromazine. Right. Like I've seen that um, used and it just sort of depends. I mean, even even something like uh, propranolol, which isn't actually technically a psychotropic medication, but it was made to manage hypertension. But it has it can have. Mm-hmm. a psycho, Yeah, it can make it have a psychoactive effect. So sometimes you'll see people who are on propranolol as an attempt to treat problem behavior. Yes. Yeah, I, I've seen that one for sure. So. Like, how is it that they came up with it being for autism, like Risperidone? I, you know what? I Any never, idea? I never, no, I never looked no. into it. No, yeah. that's, uh, I, I usually, I uh, not usually, I always defer. I see my role in this as informative for the prescribing physician, right. as empowering the family to advocate. So um, I did a training study that I'm hoping that's been submitted um, and hopefully it will be accepted. It was for behavior analysts. It's called Medication for behavior analysts or train medication training for behavior analysts or something like that. Cool. Um, I said, I have a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes I can't remember the titles of everything I've got. <laughs> but. So uh, we saw some really nice outcomes, um, some areas for improvement, obviously. And it was actually, I was in response to exactly what you said a couple minutes ago, which was that there isn't a lot of training for behavior analysts, especially our uh, BCPAs. Like there might be some, you know, who have some opportunities in coursework, but really in terms of, 
extending, continuing ed, there's really, there's not much out there. Anyway, so uh, I forget what the point of talking about that was, what we were talking about. <laughs> well, I just kind of want to know, um, well, I, originally I was sort of asking about like why autism, right, yeah. but I, I, uh, I guess what I want to know is um, what is our role? Yes, that's right. The role stuff. Ugh. So um, that sort of lines up with the behavior on or the paper we were just talking about, the Coxidel, uh 2021. And it's to use the information you have to inform the psychiatrist and what that looks like might vary. So when I'm trying to generate a relationship with a psychiatrist, A, I'm begging them to let me come to the, um, the meeting, right? The consult. Mm-hmm. If they don't, if they if they are not comfortable or whatever, then I speak to the family and the caregiver. So if they're a person who's in a group home or whatever, and I'm a behavior analyst that's consulting to that group home, then I will create a data protocol, data a uh, data collection protocol that will inform specifically what we're interested in. So if they're worried about side effects, okay, you know, let's think about this or let's call this the pharmacist is a very untapped resource. If you do not if if you can't call and get a hold of the psychiatrist, you can talk to a pharmacist about side effects. Um you can talk to them about pretty much anything. They they are an untapped resource. Anyway, so hmm. um you know, what should we be concerned about uh in terms of side effects? Okay, well say, you know, um Last time he went on some of these different med changes, it seems like this was happening. It seems like he was more nauseous or he did. He stopped eating a lot. And that was kind of weird for him because he loves food. OK, so then you query nausea. So what you're doing is maybe you're doing a food diary. Maybe you're doing uh, you're you're actually doing something more uh, intense. So you're looking at how much are they drinking during the day? How much are they eating during the day? Exactly how much? So, you know, things like that, because then if they it suddenly drops off, it's not anecdotal anymore because you have the data and you could say, OK, guys. A cost benefit analysis, we're seeing a lot less problem behavior, but we're also, he's also eating a lot less. Is that going to be a problem in the future? So is, is he completely anorexic in the sense that he's not eating enough to sustain himself over the long mm-hmm. term? That's a problem. And that's a side effect that we have to bring back and say, okay, we're very concerned about his intake of food. Is there something else? Is there another drug we could try that could have the same effect, but not so be detrimental? Because like, this is the, it's all a balance, right? Um, yeah. So you are just trying to make yourself as useful to family in terms of advocating to uh, if you can get in with a psychiatrist to them. So if you have a psychiatrist who wants to play ball, I would say do like one thing for them. They only have 20 minutes. In Ontario, you have 20 minutes or whatever it is. A very short period of time. So you say, what kind of information do you need to know Mm. whether or not this med is doing what, you know? And most of them will have an idea. They're like, I want sleep. I want sleep data. Mm. Okay, cool. Sleep data, I can get you. Um, And then when you come back with the information that they want, do not make like a million charts and like all this stuff unless they ask for it. If they ask sure. for it, you know, kiss them on the cheek and maybe that's inappropriate, but be very excited because they <laughs> probably won't ask for it. Do a statement that is eight sentences or less about the intervention or the, uh, the assessment, the outcomes. And like, it's very straightforward. This is what we did. This is what we found. And this is the information you asked for. Done. And then if they want to like, tease that conversation out and be like, what's exactly you have your notes ready, you have your graphs ready, and you can just like pull that information out. But I find it's much it goes over a lot better if they if you don't throw a bunch of like charts and graphs at them, you just Mm. boil it down, like boil it down for me what what's happening. That's cool. So the psychiatrist not I mean, it's hard to know what they're doing if you're not there. But are they not asking for this information anyway? Um, it's individualized. Like I, Mm. you know, I've had, you know, students come to me and say, like, it's, I can't get an appointment or I've tried to recruit participants for studies through agencies. And they're like, you know, we would love to participate, but like our psychiatrist doesn't want anything to do with us. And then I've had the exact opposite where the psychiatrist is like, welcome behavior analysis. Like I said about the, the one that I worked with. And there's a couple in the, in our area that are really well known because they do work um, exclusively with this client base and they want those behavior analysts there and they speak very highly of them and they feel like their their impact is so much more improved because the behavior analyst is bringing them information about what what's happening with the client after a change well i guess yeah but what i mean is is um you know psychiatrist prescribes a medication and you know it could really affect someone's sleep if you're not there to give them that information are they not asking the family for that information anyway The second secret word is medication. 
Oh, yes. And that, well, if you're, if you're completely removed from the situation, they would absolutely be asking the family, but what is the family reporting? Right. It's all anecdotal. Right. right. And so all like a lot of times what, what you run into with the anecdotal, the anecdotal reporting is that all the family remembers is the last two nights were terrible, you know, he, mm. what, you know, up and up and up all night. But then he, they don't remember that the three months before that, because you don't see the psychiatrist every day. You see them once mm-hmm. every, you know, couple of months or if you're, you know, if you're mm. lucky once every six weeks or whatever. So they don't remember that the rest of it was fine. And so what do they report? The last thing, the most problematic for that. Oh, he's not sleeping through the night still. And it's a problem. Okay. Let's up the med. When in fact, 28 out of those 30 days were very, very good. Right. And so that's where I'm, I'm saying, let's tweak this. Yes. Talk to the family because it's important. That anecdotal piece is important, but also let's get some hard and fast data around mm-hmm. these really important pieces so we can make you know a decision that incorporates all of these pieces that are important. So it's just that, that, that sort of recency effect, I guess. Yeah, well, that yeah, that example was recency or intensity. So another example I use is, you know, Joe, who's a staff member, works with three clients and Sally had her med changed two months ago. And the week before they have a follow up appointment, you know, Sally goes off and has a really bad day and gets really upset and, and, and hurts people. And it's because Sally's mom had to cancel a home visit last minute. But do you think Joe remembers that? No. What's he mm. going to report to the psychiatrist? Oh, she's still having so many issues because it was so intense. And mm. that's not his fault. That's like, you know, it just it is what it is. That's that's how reporting anecdotal goes. That's why we augment it with data. Um, you know, FAs, uh, preference assessments, and and we can actually pull a lot in an FA. So if you want to look at side effects in one of the lesser, the the low stimulation conditions like attention, where you're just kind of hanging out and waiting for them something to happen, that person's now falling asleep. And all the other FAs that you did beforehand, that person never fell asleep. It's possible they had a bad night's sleep, but also could it be that the medication is causing like this over sedation effect? Right. Um, mm. Or is it a side effect of that medication making someone really sleepy? And this seems to be pretty profound. And how much of that sleep is it, is it impacting their day? So there's a lot of ways that you can streamline some really good data collection strategies mm. to figure out if there are some side effects that are coming into play. And actually, um, you can program. This is really cool, too. You can program for side effects to lessen their effects. So Maria Valdivinos and Hmm. her friends in 2005 did a study on tardive dyskinesia and tardive dyskinesia. Yep. It's like just for viewers or viewers. It's when you basically have involuntary motor movements. It can look like tongue thrusting. It could be as uh, your hands could really be shaking. And I actually, in my clinical work, I evaluated this sort of um, side effect in a gentleman. And over a progressive period of about a year, he went from being able to peel a banana to not being able to peel Mm. because it was so profound. Uh, so she actually found they were trying to de- determine whether tardive dyskinesia side effects were socially mediated. They were not. However, what was really neat was that in the demand conditions where they per- they were placing like gross motor tasks, hmm. they were noticing that there were less instances of tardive dyskinesia. Huh. So they were able to bring that level of if you experience this side effect, it's really annoying. Your body's doing stuff that you're not telling it to do, right? Yeah. So if you can program that throughout that day, gross motor tasks that are going to lessen how often this behavior or this, this side effect is happening, that's a big deal when it comes to quality of life. So it's things like that that we can help from a from an intervention perspective. But when you're talking about assessment and informed sort of informing how the treatment or the um, medication change is going, that's where we can really have some impact as well. That's super interesting. Uh, so I, my experience with psychiatrists has really been kind of that sort of basic sort of, uh, you know, kind of frequency data, the, the, the like mm. you said, the, the amount of sleep or the, lo- the levels of problem behavior throughout the day, you know, based on when the meds change happen and that kind of stuff. I never really thought about sort of incorporating a preference assessment or a functional analysis to look for pieces that you're not looking for in a functional analysis. Potentially. Yeah. And FA is actually because I think we talked about this before we actually met today, Mm, uh, that the hypothesis around medications in in behavior analysis is that they could be acting as motivating operations and how they are sort of conceptualizing this. So a motivating operation, as we know, alters the effectiveness of a reinforcer or a punishing stimulus. And the reason I'm going to go into this is because it's, it's really paramount that functional analysis are incorporated somewhere in your analytic 
or your data collection process in the context of med changes because mm -hmm. it will capture those pieces. So back to MOs. So we know things like satiation and deprivation, classic examples. Um, mm -hmm. And there are other examples of MOs like you know, sleep deprivation, as well as sensory stimulation and pain, as well as, um, you know, illness can change things. And so they're actually thinking that the bodily conditions occasioned by the intake of psychotropic medications can be characterized as MOs, and they may be hmm. altering the reinforcing effects of other stimuli or interact with other operations known to evoke avoidance or escape. So an example of this is in a paper by Crossland et al. in 2003, they did a nice research study on FA and MET changes, and they talked about how it's possible that, so what they were seeing is that in the demand condition pre-medication change, they had some rates of responding and those rates seemed to come down post medication change, but selectively so. So they were responding, in, you know, maybe in other conditions, but they really noticed in some of the cases that there was this decrease in escape condition rate or demand condition rate responding. And so they were positing, is it possible that, you know, maybe that they become more tolerant, maybe the medication shifts the quote unquote aversiveness of mm -hmm. the task and the person is more tolerant. And the reason they sort of came to this, they, they speculated on this is because of this great sort of basic research that exists around the fact that psychopharmacological effects on operant processes can provide the foundation for sort of investigating. Um, they looked at the neurotransmitter dopamine mm. is, as an example. It's directly involved in positive reinforcement movement as well as aggression which is kind of neat. And so they they can manipulate very fine in a very fine way with these rats or whatever. And because neurotransmitters like dopamine is directly involved in the reward process, it's possible that, you know, the medications are shifting what you consider valuable or not valuable based on, you know, before and after. And that's also why we need to be looking at preference in the context of medication changes. Because if the preference of this individual shifts, we are out of luck if we continue to be providing what we think is a reinforcer, but is no longer a reinforcer because the medication shifted, you know, uh, the, the preference. And talking about that and speaking about that, there is also the possibility that um, medications, uh, that's a side effect. Right. So it could mm. be that, in fact, so it's not like the shifting in dopamine, blah, blah, blah. It actually is a side effect. The person is more nauseous because the medication mm -hmm. creates that side effect um, or is associated with that side effect. And so, you know, they they don't want food as a reinforcer anymore right. or even even the on the opposite side. Some medications can increase hunger, uh, how hungry somebody feels. And so. Then you get this tangible function coming out of nowhere. You're like, this person yeah, yeah, used to do yeah. escape, maintain problem behavior, but now I'm getting tangible. What the heck is going on? And it's possible that it's like, oh, wow, the value of food just skyrocketed because I am hungry all the time. And if you don't know that as a behavior analyst, you're going to be scratching your head going, why wasn't, why doesn't my, my intervention, which was targeting escape maintained work anymore? What's going on? Mm -hmm. And then you find out two days later, mom's like, oh yeah, we had a med change. And you're like, oh, thanks for telling me. <laughs> So how do you how do you how do you time a preference assessment for to for that to measure Perfect. those effects? Yeah. yeah. So it just that's a really good question. It just depends on what you want. So if you want, you just not everybody has a thousand hours to do everything in, right? And mm -hmm. I would say you know, so it, it's it is important to be very uh, very picky about the timing. I would say that if you are like every other behavior analyst and have like a huge workload, look at the half-life. So talk to the, the pharmacist, talk to the psychiatrist mm -hmm. and ask them what the half-life is for a medication if you're looking at a reduction. So you do your preference assessments, you do maybe several. So you have some stable responding, right? And base, whatever. And you consider that quote unquote, your baseline. Then the med change happens and you wait until the half-life period, which means you know that that med or you, you, it's reasonable to suspect that that medication is no longer in the system. If it's a discontinuation, right? If you're discontinuing mm. withdrawing, then you run it again. However, if you're interested in what, and this is a research question, if you're interested in what's happening to preference during the titration interval, mm. then you're going to want to run it more frequently because you're going to want to capture, you know, 
this sort of hopefully this dose dependent where you're seeing, you know, this decrease or this change, a slight change. I don't even know what that would look like because nobody's ever done it. Uh, but that's, that's how I, I would recommend just going about this. If you're adding a medication and it's a new med to the person, then it's possible. It could take up to six weeks to be quote unquote therapeutically effective or whatever. Right, right. So then you do your FA before the med change, you wait the six weeks. And again, this is a conversation you need to have with a pharmacist or psychiatrist or the prescribing mm-hmm. professional, because, um, yeah, you could Google it, but there could be some error and there's always a range. Like I said, risperidone. Three to 21 hours is half-life. It depends on how quickly the person metabolizes. The psychiatrist might know that information if they have a really good history with the person, if they, they, you know, and also if they're taking, there are some, I guess, tests that you can do as blood tests or whatever. I've had that with folks who they do these blood tests on a frequent basis because it tells you certain levels. I, I obviously don't know anything about that, but what I do know is you can ask the psychiatrist and say, hey, what was the outcome of that blood test? And, you know, then you could, you guys could figure it out together. So there's a lot of um, teamwork that I think could happen here and it could go a long way to being efficient with your time as a behavior analyst. Totally. And I was thinking about the levels thing as you were talking about it, because I know I had a few guys that, uh, you know, would start a new medication and they'd have to get, uh, there's uh, some some seizure ones in particular where they have to kind of get the, the blood levels done every month. Yes. Um, yep. And so there's potentially an opportunity there to, you know, use that blood level measure, you know, as sort of a, a correlate when you're kind of measuring some of this stuff too. So yes, what, yeah, what, whatever the information that the psychiatrist can provide for you. The other yeah. thing um, that's important to know is that as I understand it, side effects occur right away, whereas the therapeutic benefit could happen you know, three, six, whatever weeks later. So it's possible that, the, and, and it's, you gotta be very cautious about this. It's possible you could see some sort of spike in problem behavior or even like significant reduction in problem behavior, but a withdrawal, more like a withdrawal, Mm -hmm. like the person is not no longer themselves, which isn't good either, but it could be in response to a side effect. And then you sort of see that level off when the medication sort of kick, like the therapeutic piece sort of kicks in. So it's really important to know that, you know, you have to, if you're looking for side effects, you need to be doing that on the ongoing basis. But if you're looking for, you know, therapeutic outcomes, then those might, uh, and how to measure those like behavior analytically, I'm not talking about, like, I do not want to lead anybody out of their scope. Like you are just there to like put together an assessment, like behavior analytic, direct observation, whatever. You're not like doing it to make changes to the med or something. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear about that. But it it just, again, it depends on the information that you want. Uh, And these are, these are great conversations for the, to engage the psychiatrist as well, to be asking these informed questions. So they're like, oh, like this person is invested in my work by asking this really informed question about half-life or whatever. So yeah, maybe I'll, you know, throw them a bone and we can make this work. Crazy. I was just thinking, I don't, I don't even know if it's what, what, what the question is here, but just thinking about how, and again, maybe this isn't our, our scope, our realm, but how psychiatrists prescribe medications for folks that are like really kind of on the severe end of disability and, you know, can't communicate side effects, can't tell you what's going on, can't tell you how they're feeling. Is there ways that we can you know, observe side effects that normally we'd have to have folks tell us? And this is this is the rub. There's very little research on direct observation of side effects. There's one uh, great paper by uh, Val Davinos, and it's called Adverse Side Effects of Psychotropic Medication and Challenging Behavior. And she is one of the only ones in our field that she basically tried to manipulate or change uh, FA conditions to evaluate side effects, mm. the most common side effects. So it's really tough. Um, she's got some earlier work that they did. It's in uh, 2000 and what is it? 2005. And they basically looked at a bunch of um, chart review, like they did a chart review and they tried to, you know, pull some information out about side effects there. And there are a ton of indirect measures that people use to try to measure side effects. But again, the problem is you, we don't know how they're going to manifest, right? If somebody is really hungry, it could manifest as increased aggression to access food, 
right? Mm-hmm. And But to the untrained eye, it just looks like increased aggression. This med isn't working up the dosage. Mm. So then the problem behavior may become worse because the person's even more, if that's how it works, I don't know how the side effect would work necessarily, but just you think about, and this is where you're talking about, we're talking about six, seven medications Mm-hmm. because oh this one isn't working let's tap on another one oh and then we think that there's a side effect so let's get a medication to treat the side effect you know like and then it just becomes this never-ending cycle so really unfortunately i mean like i said with the tardive dyskinesia that's pretty overt yeah um and i just took ongoing video like i took video of several of the same act couple of gross motor activities throughout a period of time to just measure that um, so that we knew kind of where we were going with it or what we were going to try to do about it. Um, But things like a headache, Mm -hmm. right? You know, like how do you, and she actually looks at that in the paper. Like, how do you, how do you discern whether this person's more sensitive to whatever? So the side effects are tricky, but if they're, if they can be more overt, like things like, you know, decreased appetite or increased appetite, then you need to be thinking about that, right? You need to be thinking about um, how can I capture this in a really meaningful way um yeah yeah i mean i think that that really is a a great spot for a behavior analyst because you know like things like dry mouth like dry mouth is a common one for i think a lot of these and you know i I remember i said i remember going from kind of running a group home with a bunch of guys that were on these meds and they couldn't talk and i had often wondered what the side effects were to working a bit in a psych ward and uh, listening to all these people, listen to all these, these patients kind of getting together in the, in the common area and sharing stories about side effects. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing because for the first time ever, I had heard that, you know, this medication causes dry mouth. This medication makes me pee a lot. This medication makes me constipated. Mm-hmm. And my guys are on all these medications. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, this, this could be what's going on. And so, you know, I, I love like I love your example of, of the gross motor, you know, uh, skills to kind of look at the tardive of dyskinesia i imagine there could be you know is is joe now chugging you know yes. gallons and gallons of water when he yes. never used to or is he seeking water is he drinking water out of the toilet right is he yeah. trying to drink water out of a puddle and it's like okay let's like dr this it's like no no guys let's think about it's not just differential report this is this is something that's atypical or a perfectly trained uh, a toileted child who all of a sudden starts have accidents yeah, again, yeah. increased yeah. urine volume, right? And it's like, oh, he's just doing it to, at, at, you hear like frustration in families and caregivers, like, oh, he's just doing it to be a, make me upset. But it's like, no, no, wait, if you look at like, I think it's Respiridone, don't quote me on it, but it, it, it might have this increased urine volume as a yep. side effect. And so this kid is now, you know, looking like he's not toileted anymore. And if it's an adult, God forbid, if it's an older adult, the slap on the depends or the, the, you know, the, the briefs. And it's like, no guys, let's, let's think about this. Let's be detectives here because I, I, I would hate to see, like, I would hate to see any extra, like, like a quality of life piece, like really take a nosedive and 100%. not get, you know, not get the benefit of the medication. Cause like I said, I'm not anti-med. I'm just Let's be as effective with our interventions as we possibly can be. And because there's a limited amount of literature, there is, and this paper is not behavior analytic. It's by G and Findling, and it was published in 2016. It's a review paper. It's called Pharmacotherapy for Mental Health Problems in People with Intellectual Disabilities. They Mm. summarized, it's a review paper, evidence based this is direct quote, evidence-based pharmacotherapy options in people with intellectual disabilities are limited. And many agents can cause substantial of adverse effects. For this reason, clinicians should consider pharmacotherapy as only a part of comprehensive treatment and regularly assess drug effects, adverse effects, and the feasibility of decreasing dose or withdrawing medication. That's their summary statement at the beginning mm-hmm. of their, right? And so like this is, these are not behavior analysts who are saying this. So I think there's a lot of great work that can be done. I think a lot of people are in the same boat in terms of how do we use these medications to the best of our ability. And I think maybe behavior analysts can do some more PR in terms of what they have to offer. I I know that many, you know, ABAI presidents have long said, you know, even uh, Dr. Fryman's like, we don't advertise ourselves well. We're not like, we're bad. We're we're bad PR for ourselves. We need, we need to be better at showcasing the skills that we have and how we can contribute to these in these really meaningful ways. And meds is like psychotropic medications is definitely one of them in terms of what we can bring to the table. The third secret word is effects. E-F-F-E-C-T-S. Yeah, Fryman always talks about publishing in other journals. Yes. Like 
get out of that four that you did the review on, you know, and uh, get in. You know, I think you talked about he did one in pediatrics and he did one in other places, and yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. This is so interesting. So the uh, I, I could totally see if it's been a, like a new med change, you know, or that you, you're aware of. You, you you knew the change happened, and then you can sort of do these, you know, observations for side effects and come up with different things. Have you had any experience where it's and, and maybe this is just more about the relationship you're building with a psychiatrist and, and, and you kind of get to that point down the road where they might be open to listening to this, this hypothesis that like behaviors that have been long standing, but the medication has also been long standing. And so is it possible that for years and years and years, the behavior you're seeing is solely a, an effect of the medication that was prescribed 10 years ago? And is that is that maybe just like a relationship with a psychiatrist to sort of say, hey, do you think we can look at this now? I mean, I uh, I think I think so. I think rapport is going to go a long way in terms of, you know, trying to encourage exploring, you know, medication reductions, Mm. uh, especially if it's not working. But you have to have a really I would say. You have to have a really good relationship with psychiatrists, but you have to have a really strong relationship with the caregivers because sure. they are going to be on the receiving end of frontline staff, like saying, why are we trying this? Like, why don't we add more? Like, there's a lot of different opinions that have to be considered. And I, I know one way that a, psychiat- a psychiatrist I've worked with for has handled it is that he only does very tiny, tiny med changes. Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like he's like, it's, he said, it's almost like a psychological thing for the frontline staff. Oh, he only decreased that med by a teeny tiny little bit. It couldn't possibly be that, right? So if he he finds that it takes him three years to get the, the client off a med, but he does so with a least, it's the path of least resistance because staff aren't coming back going, oh, it's got to be this med change. Well, he's like, but I only changed it a teeny little bit. Right. Mm. And like, let's think about what other things it could be. And then they'll mm-hmm. start thinking, oh, well, you know, they got a new roommate or this happened. Mm-hmm. Right. And then they start to think outside the box within the uh, analytic book, behavior analytic box. But that's a way that they've handled it before. Does that answer? Kind of? Yeah, I think so. I think so. It just I just started to think about sort of, you know, the these folks where you don't even know, like you might not even know who the original prescribing psychiatrist yes. was. Or what it, it was happened. for. Because it happened when they were 12 and now they're 35, but they're still on, you know, lanzapine um, or whatever. Like I had, I, like I had a kid, I had a kid who was on lanzapine from age 10 to like 25 and he was on like 15 milligrams or something high of it. And it was prescribed by someone we didn't even know. Uh, I think it was a family doctor or something at that point. It's not always a psychiatrist that's prescribing it either. Right. So, yeah. And so I just developed a really good relationship with the the new psychiatrist and he trusted sort of my judgment. And I said, can we just try reducing the meds and see what happens? And we we basically got him entirely off the olanzapine and, and, he, and, and, you know, he just stopped hitting people. You know, he'd been hitting people for 10 years. Yeah. Um, but that was just pure rapport. Like I wasn't looking at anything uh, beyond not getting hit. Yeah. Um, I don't know that others would have had success getting a doctor to just start reducing medication, yeah. you know, when you have a really aggressive, you know, individual. No, that's a really good example of where, where the relationship is key because that, that wouldn't have happened. Otherwise, like you said, he trusted your judgment. So that yeah. went a long way. And I, I agree. Like you said, a lot of times you don't even see what it was prescribed for initially as well, right? Like if it's one of those longstanding meds, I mean, if you work in a treatment facility, like the one in BC, like you're saying, they take, they, they do a a washout. You can advocate for that. I think in certain hospital settings, but sometimes they go to the hospital, they come out with more because they don't have a behavior analyst or they're in a psych ward or psychiatric ward that does not specialize in persons with the IDD. And then they are just you know, doing the their best. So uh, I I really hope that more relationships can happen, like the one you're you're talking about, because I think it would do justice for the clients. The other thing we don't really know a lot about is in, in terms of what it does at, to adaptive behavior, um, and it's possible that could impact adaptive behavior. And if you're dealing with a kid, you know, in a in, where they're whether or not they can stay in a program based on their their progress, and all of a sudden they flatline. 
uh, in terms of percentage of acquisition, whatever, but it coincides with the addition of a medication, then you got to start thinking, okay, well, did this med do something to their capacity? Because we know that medications, well, they're psychoactive. Of course, they're, you know, affecting a client's capacity to, you know, process. And it's possible that, you know, it's harder to think, it's harder to do, you know, a daily activity to, or DAS, a daily activities, mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, so anyway, there's lots of, yep. lots of areas to research. Totally, totally. Well, I had one other question, which I think maybe you already covered, but just clarify for me, because we talked a lot about how beds affect MOs and, and, and the effects, you know, can become. Does the answer to that question answer the question about how medications change the functional behavior? Um, yes. Yeah. No. So same idea. Mm-hmm. But there was one other piece that was, I think it was in one of your papers where you talked about general versus specific effects. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you see sort of all of the problem behaviors come down at the same time or mm. the problem behavior becomes undifferentiated, mm. that's like a more general impact potentially but the, like this is all hypothetical if you notice the paper you're talking about there were 37 cases in total and that was as of 2013 my my thesis adds about seven my dissertation okay. adds about seven to the publication and it's not huh. published yet and then maria valdivinos and her her folks in 2017 did something else where they added eight more cases wow. so we're looking at a review of very few and if you compare that to how many people are on meds like yeah. we got a lot we got a lot of work to do here guys like we really need to be thinking about you know how do we like i said get as much information from the data that we that we have generate relationships with clinicians, like researchers and clinicians who are serving Mm -hmm. the adult population who have, you know, a a psychiatrist who wants to play ball. Like that's how we're going to try to answer some of these questions because I just don't see any other way. But yeah, Yeah. um, the the function specific effect is when you actually see like a function shift or a function addition. So for example, you have an escape maintained problem behavior. And then when you add the med, all of a sudden you get a tangible, like multiply controlled or you know, escape is no longer the prominent function and attention jumps in there somewhere. Like that's, that's the shift. That's the function specific, but what they've really only seen more clear examples of is when escape is differentially affected by a medication. So the responding and demand condition decreases in association with the medication change that, and specifically that's around risperidone, I believe. Well, maybe we'll finish off with uh, just a couple of, you know, sort of closing thoughts for the folks. So first off, maybe kind of, um, uh, you know, just maybe some advice for folks that are, you know, just kind of coming into contact with psychiatry and medication and then follow that up with, you know, uh, how folks might want to get into doing more research. Yeah. So the coming into contact um, item, the folks coming into contact with psychiatry or meds for the first time, seek out CE opportunities. Uh, Get as much information as you can. Start by reading a paper um, by uh, Maria Valdivinos in 2019. And she kind of takes you through what an assessment strategy could look like if you have like direct observation opportunities. So that would be really helpful. It's very accessible uh, in terms of it's not like really high tech. It's just really, it gives you all the reasons why we need to be doing this. And then gives you some some starting off points. So that's like really um, good. I do have a paper coming out hopefully soon that gives you actually a checklist nice. of what you need to be doing. And I'm hoping that there will be some more uptake. And there will be uptake uh, by readers in that front. And I would definitely say coming into contact for the first time, do what you did, Ben, and what you talk about, which is you know, generating that relationship mm. um, with the psychiatrist, being as indispensable and as least irritating as possible to try to get on the ground floor, get in on the ground floor, especially if this is like a newer client who, you know, might just be starting to dabble because every time you think, you think every time a med is added, like you talked about the kiddo with olanzapine for 15 years, meds are very infrequently gotten rid of, right? So mm-hmm you know, be on the lookout for things like that. And then what was the other thing you said? Just about if if folks wanted to kind of help add to the research. Oh, yeah. If you work in one of the, in a treatment home that, you know, is messing with meds, not messing, but the psychiatrists are making um, changes to the medication to try to find that, that sweet spot, uh, reach out to 
like there's any one number, myself included, uh, Val Davinos, uh, Maria Val Davinos, uh, Jennifer Zarconia. I, sh- I don't know if she's doing a lot right now, but she she's like big. There's a lot of other names as well. If you want to get some co sort of joint initiatives going, if you want to kind mm. of branch out and do it on your own, the paper that we had talked about with all of the analyses might be one way to start to look at you know, how do we do stuff? And that might be aimed towards like behavior analysis and practice where you did something in the moment to look at a very specific question for several clients. That might be a way to do it. Uh, Yeah. Um, Read on the topic, read Mm -hmm. a lot on the topic so that you get a sense of what is really going to make the most impact. If you could answer this one question, you know, what might it be? Amazing. Amazing. I think people are going to get a real, a real, a lot out of this one. Uh, there's just, there's just so much stuff here that I think folks run into all the time and never even know what to do with it. Um, you know, they hear about medication and they just sort of, well, what do I do? Nothing, just kind of deal with it and try to implement stuff. So I think, you know, this is really gonna, really gonna open things up because I really think we need to close this gap between psychiatry and behavior analysis. And we're doing, I think we're doing a lot more than we've done than we did maybe 10 years ago, but I think we still, as you've, as you've shown with the so few cases, we've got a lot more work to do. Um, yeah. So a lot of opportunities. So certainly for the Canadian listens, listeners out here, well, you don't have to be Canadian, but um, you know, Brock's a great school. We got, U, <laughs> we, we got UBC way over here, but you got yes. Brock over there and, and, and lots of opportunities. And I know that when there's others popping up too with Western and stuff, but that's, uh, that could be a, could be an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Cox. Yeah. And especially with COVID as a silver lining is like, you know, virtual stuff, I feel like is much more. So like working with people who are at a distance is much more viable. I think totally. now because people have had to do it. So, you know, if you have an opportunity to re- like to work a relationship with somebody yeah. who's, you know, thousands of miles away, then yeah, do it. And I think that'll continue in a post-COVID world. So that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks again for being on on the podcast. Super pleasure. Super awesome to find out that there are so many more cool folks doing things in Canada, which I love. And uh, yeah, just thanks again for being on. 